So hello to everyone, um, dear fellow Meet and Code enthusiasts. A uh, really warm welcome from my side. My name is Camilla. Uh, I'm the manager of the Meet and Code program. Uh, I also welcome you on behalf of TechSoup, who am I representing? Uh, it's a network of partners who work with you locally in within Meet and Code in 35 countries. So uh, welcome. Um, I would like also to, uh, to welcome you, uh, including our foreign <coughs> partners, uh, so Stifter Health and NSAP, and our new uh, European partner, the uh, German Ministry, German Federal Ministry of the Interior. So thank you so much for being with us today for this uh, Meet and Code uh, seminar. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you already participated in Meet and Code. Uh, so for those who don't know, Meet and Code enables local nonprofit organizations to plan and realize your coding projects. So if you're interested in receiving a microfunding for up to 500 euros from your local partners, please check our Meet and Code website and register your events now. Uh, the application period ends on September 10th. So uh, just a quick uh, information, as you know, uh, in 2020, Meet and Code only funds online project events due to the global COVID pandemic. So uh, that is probably why you are with us today, because you want to offer a Meet and Code project online. Uh, so uh, we are proud to uh, to be partnering with uh, Anna, who is uh, one of our partner in, in Romania and have a lot of experience in conducting uh, meet and code projects and also uh, in conducting projects online. So she will be uh, today um, sharing with you all her tips and tricks uh, together with her uh, together with her partners. So, um, well, so uh, I would like to invite you. I wish you a great time during today's seminar. Many inspiration, a lot of knowledge uh, to prepare an amazing online coding events and empower a generation with uh, digital skins. So good luck. Thank you so much, Camila. Uh, and hello to everyone who has joined. I'm excited to have you all here. I am glad to um, be here also as a Code Week ambassador. And I have a t-shirt to even prove it, an official t-shirt of a Code Week ambassador. So we at Associatia TechSoup, I would like to start with that. We are very glad when, uh, we're very glad when three years ago we were invited to coordinate the Meet and Code initiative in Romania because we were already building STEAM resources and programs for youth and teachers. And we knew that Meet and Code would be another awesome and great opportunity to acquire digital skills. But however, after three years, I have seen firsthand that Meet and Code is more than acquiring digital skills. It's an opportunity for uh, nonprofits, teachers, students, and even parents. It empowers them to showcase their community, their creativity, and their love for technology, and more, uh, more, more even technology for good. On short, Meet and Code bring us, brings us all together. And in the spirit of bringing together on short, I'm excited to have with us today, Sonia and Nula from uh, our friends and partners at Associate TechSoup, the Coder Dojo Foundation, who will give us a lot of inspirational tips and tricks on how to manage coding online events because they have a wide experience and they will uh, tell you all about it. So Sonia, Nula, you have the floor. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Camilla. It's such an honor and such a pleasure to be here. So um, we've had an uh, exciting year this year in exploring what online events are like. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, share our learnings with you today. Um, so I'll be kicking us off, but I want to introduce you to Nula, who will be uh, sharing more later as we go along. Great, let me start sharing my screen. And we can dive right in. I can see your screen, Sonia Allwood. Excellent. Great. So um, Nula and I work for an organization that's called Coder Dojo. And um, 
Coder Dojo has been around for just shy of a decade. And the basic idea of it is that it's a global and open source movement. So we want to bring free programming clubs to young people between seven and 17. Um, really, we're not that strict. If you can read, you're welcome. Um, and uh, the idea is that we want to bring out the creativity in people. We want to bring community and bring people together in exploring technology in all shapes and sizes. Um, so we are trying to empower young people to become creators rather than follow a set curriculum. In the same vein, we encourage all our dojos to be innovative with what topics they cover and how they want to cover it. Each dojo is different and yet all share the same mission. So our purpose and our vision that everyone follows is we want a world where every child has the opportunity to learn about technology and be creative in a safe and social environment. Um, both of these parts are equally important to us and that is something that we strive for. Um, and our mission is to achieve this vision through an open sourced and global network. So. Uh, chatting to other people that have uh, similar values and a similar approach to life is what keeps us going. So we love collaborating with other people. We love being invited to events like this where we can connect with others. It, it gives us more uh, power and joy um, to keep this mission alive and going. So this is very exciting to us. Um, to kick us off, I would love to know where you guys are joining us from. Maybe you can uh, type it in the chat box, either whether you're on Facebook or you're uh, on Zoom or whatever platform we're on. Uh, use the chat box, let us know, and we'll come right back to that. Uh, the Coder Dojo Global community is, we currently have, well, as of two days ago, we had 2,286 dojos. A dojo is basically a club. Um, so that is a location, that's a group of people that come together as a community and that meet, uh, be it some meet every week, some meet once a month or anything in between. Um, these are spread out across 115 countries. We started out in Ireland, in the south of Ireland, in Cork, and um, it has exponentially grown from there. Right now, our biggest communities are still in Ireland, then uh, in the UK, in the United States, and in Japan. Those are our four biggest communities, but we're on all continents. Um, and that is very exciting. So ninjas are our participants. Um, currently, there would be 45,720 ninjas, give or take. Um, and overall, we've recently calculated we would have touched the lives of roughly 270,000 kids over the span of our work. Um, Nula or Anna, could you share a little bit where our participants are from? Yes, of course. So we've had a lot of people entering in where they're joining us from. A lot of people joining from Germany. Sonia, you'll be delighted to hear. Um, there's also a column from Ireland. Uh, we have uh, people joining us from Lithuania, Serbia, uh, Belgium, uh, more Romania, uh, the Philippines, Budapest, Portugal, all across Europe, really. Um, nice yeah. that's Hungary, awesome poland amazing cool the more diverse the better yeah nula said i'd be happy about the german it's not in general it's just that i'm german and uh i'm currently i'm spending two weeks in germany so um while i usually live in ireland now where our foundation is based i'm currently in germany i came for my niece starting school Cool. Okay. So um, this concept can be applied anywhere in the world and is being applied anywhere in the world. I think the joy of it is that it's, uh, it's very creative and it asks that of the volunteers. Um, there is great structure and resources 
but it's applicable anywhere in the world where you would like it to be, no matter what your school systems are, no matter what your youth support is in your countries, um, it's doable. Um, our model is an open source model. I've mentioned this several times now, but I want to underline this because I often get questions late in the call of how much does it cost to use your resources? How do I get involved? It's open source, meaning we love for people to use our educational materials. Uh, we love for people to apply this for the good of their community, as long as they keep to making it open source, making it free, making it inclusive. So anyone in the world can start a dojo. Anyone in the world can, can start out or connect with others that are already doing it, um, as long as you follow the vision and register with us so we know what's going on. Uh, but if you want to be uh, like a positive change in the world and you like these materials, we'd love to have you. But now that uh, we you have a general idea roughly of what we are, really we, we are here to talk about um, how can you do things online in a reasonable way. And um, we used to never allow that. We used to be very strong on you need to meet people to be a community. But that all changed in March when we couldn't meet in person anymore. And rather than put a stop to it, we made the, I wanna say courageous step of helping our clubs move online. But that came with loads of things to consider from safeguarding to tools to uh, volunteers wanting to do it or not. Uh, we've done a lot of learnings, um, we ourselves, our community members that they gave back to us. Um, and it was, it's been some intense months, uh, but it was so good to make these learnings. So I'm very pleased that um, we can share some of those with you today and, and hopefully make things smooth and easy for you. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Nula, who is our wizard um in that area thank you very much sonia um if you want to jump on to the next slide that would be amazing so as uh sonia mentioned um oh back a slide sonia if that's okay sorry oh. perfect um so as sonia mentioned my name is nula i'm the global engagement manager with the kudu dojo foundation and as part of that role um, I help uh, community members connect with each other and share their experiences and also collate the learnings that we have and share it out with the community so that they can build on that knowledge and make it easier for running their clubs. Now, normally uh, this or prior to the pandemic, this would have been in person sessions. We really encourage uh, social interaction, as Sonia mentioned, um, to help that learning experience because we're not just focused on learning coding, we're focused, um, as Anna mentioned, the whole idea of creativity and using technology for social good, that meet and code also follows as well. Um, so as part of that, dojos are highly social um, and they're interactive. And given that they're indoor and in person, they were highly affected by the pandemic. So a lot of clubs paused activity quite quickly in March, um, but some opportunities also came out of that. So about 50% of our volunteers would be involved in STEM or in the technology sector. So that means that they already had some experience maybe in their work lives of using video conferencing tools um, and using technology in different ways. So those opportunities to meet and uh, run online sessions meant that our clubs were in a good position to move online. So thinking about some of the ways that we supported clubs to do this was that we developed guidance and we emailed this to clubs. So this guidance was developed uh, in tandem with uh, community members that were already trying things. So as the pandemic affected different areas at different times in different countries, we were able to take learnings from, for example, Italy, where we have a high proportion of clubs um, who were impacted quite early on and take learnings from that and share it with other clubs around the world. 
We also started regular community calls, just like this one. Um, I host a call uh, regularly with uh, another colleague, Kat. Um, and if you're interested in joining those, I've included a link on the slide if you want to learn more. So they include both training sessions and uh, supports to help clubs learn how they can run online, um, but also do other things as well. So sending activities out remotely if you want uh, young people to work in their own time at home, and also giving uh, training on the use of Scratch. Our call this week is on how to use and introduce Python to your club. So a real variety of supports and trainings in that call. And part of the reason why the, the content of the call is so broad is that part of the reason behind it is to help ensure that the community is connected at this time. So while a lot of clubs have been able to transition online, for others, it's been more of a struggle. And we want to make sure that those volunteers are still uh, connected with us and able to connect with other community members around the world so that they feel supported when they are able to either resume in person, send out activities or run online sessions. And then the third thing we did was we set up a Slack channel to help encourage community discussion. So we already had a Coder Dojo Slack instance, um, but we designated a specific area for online sessions and then encourage community members to share what they were trying out, ask questions. I've included a few examples here on the slide so you get an idea of the kind of things people are asking and how community members are helping each other out um, and sharing what they've learned, which is amazing. Um, Sonia, can you go to the next slide, please? Perfect. So just to talk through some of the initial guidance we uh, sent through to community members, and this has changed slightly as um, more in-person sessions have been able to uh, resume, even though they've had to adapt to the uh, local guidance. Um, but these are the three key things that we suggested at the time. So we encouraged um, dojos who were able to, to send out activities remotely. Um, we have a uh, step-by-step project. So a lot of our resources um, that Sonia mentioned, they're already available online. So our projects are available for a young person to complete themselves in their own time already directly from our website. And this allows for anyone anywhere in the world to access uh, the projects that we have for free. Um, so if they couldn't uh, meet online or meet in person, we highlighted that this was an option, that we have the resources there. So if young people wanted to lead their own learning, that we fully supported that. We also started uh, Digital Making from Home, which is a series of uh, code along videos. Some of these are live streamed, some of these are pre-recorded so young people can uh, start and go back if they need to, if they uh, learn at a different speed, for example, or if they just prefer to watch it at a different time to the live stream. Um, we also encouraged and supported clubs to send out activities such as them projects that I mentioned, but also challenges. Um, and I'll highlight some examples from clubs about these the types of challenges later um, and also to get feedback and share some of the projects that young people sent back to them with the wider club. And then in terms of running online, which I know is a lot of the reason why people are here today, um, we discussed the ways that this could be done. So there's some one simple way to run online. You could decide to live stream, you could decide to use video conferencing software, and even within that, you might decide to structure it in different ways. And we also talked about the tools and safeguarding, which were the two things that came up again and again um, for our community members in terms of things that they had questions about and had maybe apprehensions or needed additional support on. Uh, Sonia, if you can go to the next slide. Perfect. So talking about online sessions, um, we talk about this as uh, young people working together independently on different activities and volunteers supporting them in real time. So the, the benefit of this approach as opposed to sending activities and waiting for responses to come back to you is that it's a lot more interactive and engaging for young people. It's the closest way to um, replicate what happens in a dojo um, when you can't meet in person. 
uh, because there is that interactivity, you're getting feedback from young people. Uh, sometimes they're able to share their screens. Multiple uh, young people can share their screens at once and show what different projects each of them are working on. If they have um, an issue, they're able to get it debugged there and then. So it can that uh, interactivity um, is something that the other approaches uh, don't offer as much. Um, and it's also a useful approach if you're interested in sending out activities um, to combine with uh, the other options. So you could send out activities, have young people work on them, and then organize a live session if you want to check in with them at any time. And then the key considerations with this approach is the safety of young people online. That's always our key consideration, regardless if you're running in person or online, um, but always worth mentioning. Uh, in this new space of online sessions that people mightn't be as uh, confident or sure of um, how to maintain that safety. Uh, choosing the right tool, communicating with parents, and then structuring your session. And a lot of these overlap as well. Uh, next slide, please. So thinking about the safety considerations that I mentioned earlier, in uh, Kuru Dojo's guidance, we recommend that at least two adults are present at all times, and at least one of those is registered with us, and that they're uh, either background checked or vetted, um, whichever you describe it as. But the idea of having two adults present is in any online space. So if you're using breakout rooms, you would need to have additional volunteers to have two adults uh, present in those spaces just to make sure that uh, everything's above board, nothing untoward is happening, um, and that the, the safety of children is ensured. There's some other things to also that are really important in terms of this is making sure uh, there's parental consent. One really quick way of doing this is uh, making sure all your communication is only going directly through the parent. That way uh, the parent knows what time the sessions are on, what kind of content they'll be doing, what the kind of expectation is from that side. And if you keep the communication flow through the parent, then um, by participating, you know that the parent is aware of what's going on as they've passed the information to the child. Um, we recommend that participants, so the children are in an open area of the house and that the parent or carer is present in the house at that time. That might be in a, a communal room like a sitting room or it might be in a room with the door open so the parent can check in and out they can hear what's going on um, and if they need to they can see look over their shoulder anything like that they don't necessarily need to be sitting beside them even though a lot of parents do enjoy that aspect because they get to see um, exactly what their child is learning in a Kura Dojo session where in a lot of after school activities previously, they might have been a bit separate to the activity when they're learning at home online through a session. And um, it gives an opportunity for parents to get involved, see what their child is learning and even learn along with them. Parents should also know uh, how to report concerns. So we have a safeguarding policy um, and a procedure. We have a 24 hour call line if people need to ring in emergencies. And we also have a, a a report form that people can fill in just if they've any um, maybe smaller concerns that they wanted to raise with us. So making sure that parents are aware of that and volunteers are aware of that process, just make sure uh, everything is out in the open. And um, as I mentioned, communication should be directly um, through the parents, but when you're in the session, it should be out in the open. So having group chats like we have here on uh, this Zoom call, uh, there's settings where you can disable private or direct messaging between participants and between the participants and the host. That just minimizes any uh, risks um, with private messaging. Uh, making sure your uh, background space is child friendly. So just having a look around your room when you're setting up your camera and things like that to make sure there's nothing untoward that you wouldn't be happy um, with a child or family member seeing um, and also making sure if you're sharing your screen, same goes uh, with your computer background and your computer screen. And similarly, don't share any personal details uh, with learners as well. Next slide. Perfect. So I already talked about safeguarding, but tools is another uh, area that we get a lot of questions about. 
And one of the key things to think about is what kind of session that you are comfortable running and that your club members are also comfortable and excited to take part in. So having deciding on the level of interactivity um, and how comfortable you are talking to camera, maybe how comfortable you are with running live, maybe pre-recording something um, and also how many um, volunteers or additional people you have to support you in running is another consideration as well. Thinking about tools that learners or the children have already used. So some schools might already be implementing uh, online learning. So if the school has uh, decided on Microsoft Teams or Zoom, it makes a lot of sense for you to use a similar tool. And this just reduces the amount that the child needs to think about how to use the tool while they're also learning how to code um, and any of the other elements that their, their cognitive load isn't being impacted um, by the tool as well as what they're trying to learn. Host controls, like I mentioned, being able to turn off private messaging is a really important one. Um, some tools like Google Hangouts, there is no uh, private messaging function. So everything is already out in the open. So bearing those kind of things in mind, um, other things like accessibility. So does it require account setup, installation? What, does it work on multiple operating systems and web browsers? A lot of the larger options would, but if you're going for something a little more niche, you might need to uh, think about that, that side of things. And also, is it free to use? Um, that's obviously very important to us. We're um, a free uh, coding organization and we want uh, volunteers not to be under any pressure that they need to uh, spend money on anything and the classes are free for young people to participate in. So we don't want cost uh, to, to be a barrier to uh, people participating, but thankfully there are a lot of free options out there for clubs. Uh, next slide, Sonia. So keeping young people engaged, I'm just going to go through three uh, challenges really quickly um, and talk you through uh, some um, ways you can solve them. Um, and this is coming directly from community members that have told us what the challenges they faced when running online sessions were and how they overcame them. So keeping young people engaged. I'm sure this is for anyone who's currently also trying to teach online. They have similar experiences. Um, it might be hard for young people, particularly younger children, to adapt to interacting online. Um, and also if you're appealing to a diverse uh, group of children. So this uh, Kuru Dojo um, is open to seven to 17 year olds. So if you're a seven year old and you're trying to um, engage with an online session the same way as say someone who's 15 and 16, your experience might be different. So to make sure that you're appealing to the different age ranges and also experience levels of the people in your club is important. So some of the solutions around these challenges can be um, involving the young people in the session. So having them um, demonstrate the things that they worked on last week, what they're thinking of adding this week, encouraging uh, uh, other young people to give feedback. Um, a lot of our sessions start off and end with either a start with an icebreaker. So the, the full group um, is in the one online space and they might introduce themselves, say what they were working on last week, saying what they're hoping to work on this week. And then at the end of the session, they might showcase their project. Um, and this just encourages um, that social element to keep it engaging for young people. And then also involving them in the club creation. So this could be helping them decide on the code of behavior. So helping them decide um, what's appropriate in an online session. Do we start with all our mics muted? Do we start with all our cameras off? That kind of thing. And just involving them in that process so they, they have buy-in uh, to the whole uh, scenario. So some of the other ways you can appeal to a diverse range group of children might be um, encourage them to uh, follow projects that link directly to things they're interested in. So um, some sessions might, if you have um, a, a group of young people that are maybe roughly the same age and um, roughly the same background, say if you're teaching a, a specific class of children from, um, and when I say class, I mean in school, a school group, um, 
that they might be interested in a very similar topic. So you could make a project where you make a website about the, the child's school. Um, whereas if you have a, a wider range of children participating in your club, you might choose, ask them to pick projects that they're interested in more uh, specifically as individuals. So one child might pick football, another child might pick dancing, that kind of idea. Um, taking part in topical and timely challenges. So a lot of uh, competitions are currently being run that have online elements. We had coolest projects uh, online earlier in the year um, that young people could submit projects to, but other things like that that are happening is a really uh, good opportunity to keep that engagement up. Um, for live streaming, one thing to be aware of is speed. Um, so if you have younger children, they might need it to be slowing down um, and to just think about pauses, think about uh, parts of the project that might be a bit more challenging. You might slow down, just check in with everyone. Is this an OK speed? Get children to do thumbs up, thumbs down, and then you immediately can adjust to that in real time, which is great. And then the other option is breakout rooms. So if you have that wide age range or experience range, you could separate young children into the different experience levels they have. So it might be beginner scratch, intermediate Python or advanced um, HTML, things like that can be really helpful as well. Next slide. Um, building online connections. So as similar to with engagement, um, the social element is so important in Kudur Dojo that this was a thing that uh, community members mentioned to us as uh, more challenging in an online session than they previously experienced. So the loss of a social element and um, facilitating connections and keeping online chat safe. So it's always, always a balance. Um, so icebreakers, Kahoot is a great option. Um, it allows you to uh, either use the pre-med or create your own quizzes that young people can interact with. So you can have quick quiz rounds at the start of a session to introduce concepts. You can even use it um, partially to help assess if young people understand a concept at the end of a session as well. Um, sharing a thing you've learned during the session and um, encouraging uh, young people to share what they're working on. You can use Scratch Studios and um, things like uh, sharing trinket links in the, scratch, in the, in the chat so other young people can see the projects that different children are working on and, and also uh, having a group open chat in terms of keeping um, both the chat safe and also for helping build that, that group um, understanding so that all the other children know what different children are working on. If one child posts a question or is unsure of something or has an issue, they can mention it in the chat and then the other children can chip in and provide support so it doesn't necessarily need to be the volunteer either. Next slide, please. Um, providing effective feedback and support. Um, so this can be really challenging, um, particularly the communicating when people get stuck. So children um, might be more, um, might have been, you might have been able to pick up on in an in-person session. If a child wasn't sure what they were doing, they might just, um, you'd kind of you'd understand you'd see them beside their laptop and you'd you'd know that they weren't maybe progressing through a project but that's a lot harder when you're looking at a screen um, so ways you can overcome that is to debug online so jitsi and uh, zoom also allows for it which is multi-screen sharing so here's an example from a dojo in italy where they encouraged all the ninjas to share the the project while they were working on it so then different children could see what different um what the other children were making um and then if one child got stuck you could quickly see they've stopped moving pro or moving blocks on the screen and you could ask them if they needed additional help um and also using the breakout rooms um really helps as well for maybe shyer children that might be less likely to speak outright to a larger group um, to get that support. Um, and then demonstrating effective feedback techniques to young people. So if young people at the start of the session, if you tell them how to use the mic, how to use the chat, how to raise their hand, um, and then you demonstrate that in the session, they'll be more likely to pick up on how to do it and do it 
uh, throughout as well. Yes, next slide, Sonia. Thank you, Nula, for uh, sharing uh, with us this first insight on how to tackle such a variety of challenges. We can see that we're, we have, we're having a lot of challenges, even more so uh, in this year. Um, I have to confess Slack and Kahoot are also my favorite online tools for communicating and doing icebreakers. And now we would like to ask you, those who are watching us, what kind of online sessions are you planning to run and why? It can be a short answer, it can be a medium long answer, anything um, we would like to hear you, to read you. It can, we would love to hear if you are planning uh, on doing Scratch maybe or any other uh, online coding events. We will be with an eye on Facebook and, and Zoom and we would love to see your ideas. Because of course, because you are, you are here, I'm convinced you have or are planning to do some, side, some um, kind of coding events or online session and we would like to hear your ideas and here we are we we have started to get some responses scratch any online session and why of course we would love, are you a teacher? Are you a nonprofit that, uh, of course, has a meet and code event or are planning to, uh, is planning to do one? Scratch for beginners, I see, Nula. So Scratch is a very beloved tool also in Romania. And I'm, I'm also like a kid when playing in Scratch. Let's see. Yeah, definitely. Other... I think over 90% of uh, Coder Dojo clubs around the world use Scratch. So yeah, definitely really popular tool. And it's also great for online sessions because the, when you're making a project, the, the link is unique. So it's really easy to share the link in a chat and then you can see the project and help debug it in real time. Mm -hmm. okay. Minecraft also is a favorite I see. Mm, young Garage Lab, building a robot and coding it to follow a line. That sounds interesting. Alternative reality online session. Oh my God, I want to join. Make, making stuff in Tinkercad. Yes, Tinkercad rules also. Also a good question. Why we do not address seniors as well? Well, I have seen uh, a lot of great events for seniors in our libraries, for example. Unfortunately, we're meet and code targeted, uh, targets youth and children, but we are happy to see other initiatives that uh, target seniors because mm. I know a lot of um, Coder Dojo is aimed specifically at seven to seventeen year olds, but I I get that point, and I really think that young people working at home, this is a great opportunity if they're living with an older relative or their parents for their parents to also get involved or that older person. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely uh, good options. And one more, M blocks for coding on an Arduino Uno. Mm, that sounds interesting also. So we can see there are a lot of a variety of uh, mm. events, of uh, ideas, and I love this creativity and possibilities. So yeah. this was it, thank you. Great. Um, so now I'll just go through a quick few case studies but it's great to see all those options and keep those ideas uh, coming forward all the time. Uh, and we'll get back to those comments a little later on. Um, so this example from Japan, um, Yudea has held four online sessions already since by the end of May, he held them earlier in the year. Um, and he found it was not just programming, it was a chance to experience a new way of gathering together online. Um, so that's a really important thing because a lot of people are really um, missing that social connection that they might have had and particularly children when schools aren't open in their countries or if they, they were on a, a were paused for a while. Um, young people really appreciated that they were able to still join their dojos online and meet their friends and share what they were working on and keep that idea of community and 
keep that connection to the volunteers um, maintained. So they use Zoom. Um, they shared out instructions of how to use it with a PC and a tablet um, because not all the participants would have computers at home. Um, and they used a scratch studio so young people could then submit their projects after the dojo session to the scratch studio and then all the children could see what their friends were also making during the session. Um, they also had a lot of fun with the virtual backgrounds. I just did a quick uh, GIF to give you an example of some of the fun stuff you can also do in your online sessions as well. And this is from the 1st to the 18th of May across Japan. They held 172 online sessions and they accommodated 781 people. So just to give you an example of the numbers that we're talking about in terms of online sessions. Uh, next slide. Um, but I also want to give you some ideas for um, other ways that you can encourage online learning. Um, but maybe if you haven't um, the bandwidth or the, the tools for running online. Um, so Dury uh, Koder Dojo set team challenges. So they send a weekly newsletter. They give uh, a team uh, that young people can create a project around. And then they give some suggested resources to code at home. Um, but they can really code the project in any language. Um, and then afterwards, they uh, email um, the email back with the, the projects that the young people have created, and they share those out on the club's blog each week. Um, so some example include superhero springtime, so really kind of open uh, themes so that young people can create um, a wide diversity of projects around that, depending on what their interests are. Next slide. And then Warrington Dojo in England, um, they decided to similarly give challenges. So some of this was fixing an adapting project. So they created a project um, either in Scratch or in other languages that didn't work. So there was something broken in the project and the challenge to the young people were, was find out what's broken in the project and fix it so it works. Um, and I thought this was a really fun idea um, and a bit different to following a step-by-step -step project that the children are specifically given a challenge of uh, fixing something and figuring out how to debug uh, using that approach. Um, and then they, gave, they also gave um, a PDF with tips so the child wasn't alone or didn't feel overwhelmed with trying to fix the project. They did have some guidance on how to do it. Um, and then they were encouraged to adapt the projects and change them however they wanted. Um, they also did a Microsoft challenge with uh, 30 quick and fun uh, daily activities. This might be um, like really small things like initially make a block, um, make a unicorn, you know, each day they'd make something small. Um, but then at the end of the end of the month, they could say I've completed every task this day. Um, and it's just to, an idea of how you can keep uh, young people coding kind of regularly. Um, even if it isn't a big, uh, big project all in one go. And um, so how they used for sharing, sharing the creations that young people made is they set up a Google form um, and then they also tag, uh, they, they tweet or post on Facebook and tag the club in those posts so then the club can reshare them as well. Next slide. Um, and then in Japan, so this example again from Japan is looking at how clubs who went online then adapted to go back in person. So CATS ran three uh, online sessions from March to May. And uh, he found that it favored some uh, children more than others, some children that found um, the big social groups of their in-person events more socially challenging or just that interaction in real, in real life more challenging that they actually preferred the online sessions. Um, they did have lower attendance than in person, and I think um, a lot of clubs have found that, um, that uh, either through access or just uh, families having a lot going on, especially in the, the first few months of the pandemic, that uh, having uh, the online sessions maybe didn't suit their, their schedules, or if there was uh, one laptop being shared within a household, that maybe the timing didn't work, things like that. Um, schools and venues opened, uh, they decided that they would restart their in-person sessions, um, but with a blended approach, so including those online elements. 
So they do some adaption, so temperature checks at the door, um, and the aim of them doing the, the online element while they have been able to return in person is to make the club more resilient. So they're prepared if there's a second wave or outbreaks in their area that they can quickly adapt to going online. So this is something that we really encourage for clubs that are returning to in person to, if you have done online before, take those learnings with you when you return to in person. And when you're in person, if you hadn't run online sessions um, during, or during the pandemic, to use this opportunity now that you're back in person to maybe help train young people in those tools so that if the situation arises, you're able to quickly um, return to uh, online sessions and you don't need to pause your club again. Um, some of the things that they found, oh, sorry, <laughs> some of the things they found uh, was that peer interaction was slightly more difficult um, because you're managing uh, two groups. So they decided to run the session synchronously. Um, so they projected the, the Zoom call um, onto the wall of where they were hosting the in-person session. They had lower numbers attending in the in-person session, and then they had the other uh, children participate online. Um, so he found it tiring, but obviously this was that was the first time he tried it. So I think as you get used to anything, the first time is always while you're trying to figure everything out, it can be a bit more tiring um, to just to get used to the new approach. Next slide. And then this example from the Netherlands um, also highlights uh, uh, the different uh, adaptions that the club leader had to make for in-person but he also took something that he learned from the online session and brought it to the, the in-person dojo, which I think is a really good um, thing to think about of that even when things return to in-person, there's things that having run online sessions, you've now gained and learned that you can bring back to your in-person sessions. So one of the things they've done is um, previously, if a child had a problem, they'd ask a mentor beside them and the mentor would come over their so shoulder and you know, help them out or talk them through the problem. Um, but obviously uh, with different social distancing restrictions in place, um, what they do instead is they put the question up on a screen and then all the young people can think about the, the problem and help the child solve the question um, there and then. So there's less um, physical interaction, but the, the whole group and the young people are more involved in the problem solving. Um, for each specific uh, issue that comes up. Um, so yeah, perfect, next slide. So um, some of the more ways uh, you can learn more about Color Dojo and stay in touch with us is to visit our website um, and also you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we're also on Instagram if people prefer that as well. Um, so they're just some of the ways you can stay in touch with us and if you have any questions for us, feel free to give us uh, a message. Thank you, Nula. Some questions have already popped out. If you, if you would like to help me. So um, you mentioned that example, but can you go uh, maybe a little uh, deeper? How can participants uh, well learn coding if they do not have computers? How, they, how can they learn? Mm. So usually we require them to, for run, to be in, involved in the online session, there is a requirement for them to have some device. So while they might not have a computer, they might use either a tablet or mobile. Um, and a lot of the, the online tools facilitate that and our projects um, are mobile friendly, which is great. Um, it does bear in mind, it is like more challenging for the child to participate in the online session and learn the project. So if you were in an area where a lot of the young people involved in your club or your group didn't have access to a device that wasn't either a tablet or a phone, you might decide instead of running online sessions, which would encourage them to try and use two things at once, that you send the activities and they work on the activities. And then maybe you have a short, short Zoom call at one point and check in with them. So you might just decide to separate the activities out a bit more um, to facilitate the fact that they don't have um, a computer. Thank we are you. also currently launching um, a pilot of um, offline projects. Um, so those are activities that foster computational thinking in different 
aspects, and those can be printed out there in a PDF. Um, they have child appropriate um, uh, language around it. So um, as, as a teacher or uh, as a library, you can print them off and hand them out to kids um, to just do with a pen and then um, either bring them back in or not for very rural communities. For us, this is um, a pilot, but there are loads of good activities out there. Uh, for kids that absolutely have no access to internet and computers at any time. Thank you so much. Um, another question. So you mentioned all the great things your uh, your mentors are doing, your, the Coder Dojo mentors, the community. Um, a question for maybe for any of you. Uh, do you. Do you have to have a lot of technical background to be a mentor? No, not at all. So as I said, about half of our uh, volunteers have some technical experience, but the other 50% don't at all. So they might be parents or guardians of young people. They might be involved in um, education besides. So maybe they're teachers or librarians. A lot of uh, people involved in libraries decide to start up Cutter Dojo clubs. Um, so they don't need them at all. The projects on our site are available um, so that a young person can start the project and follow through step by step without needing additional technical help to do so. Um, so in that way, they don't they don't need the technical experience themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe Sonia, could you address because I, I I saw that you wrote on Zoom, but maybe also our, our Facebook viewers yeah, can benefit. Uh, which formats have proven helpful for children uh, aged? Uh, eight to 12, so little children. Yeah, I so I found from talking to our volunteers, what I heard back is that kids are so resilient and they're so, they're so good with adapting to any online format. We, I would say that the volunteers struggle more with, um, with, picking what is the perfect one, what is the right one, whereas the kids usually, they go with the flow, you have to instruct them, but but they're fine with any which one. Uh, I know dojos for that age group that use any which ones of the ones that um, Nula introduced, and they're all fine. The, the difference that I found, and Nula alluded to that when talking about um, uh, one of the Japanese dojos, we found that, that the personality of the kids really says more about whether they prefer online sessions or in-person sessions. If they're a little more shy, usually they thrive more with the online format. It seems to be a greater equalizer. Um, so it's great to have these elements in there um, to help out. But uh, yeah, any, any format should be great. Thank you, uh, because we are uh, quite uh, it's uh, it has already passed one hour has passed maybe uh, just to wrap up just some uh, advices or encouragement for all our participants from you about yeah. about how to do coding events or just the Definitely. feeling yeah one thing I really think that's come out of the pandemic is like thinking about online sessions as something that you can do a lot of the things is around restrictions, things you can't do, things, people you can't meet, all these kind of things that are li really limiting. But one of the benefits of online sessions is there's so much opportunity. There's so much things that you can achieve with it, like enabling young people to meet their friends for the first time in like two months and allowing them to create together. Um, so it's really, really, really amazing opportunity that way. Also, if you're running a club that has volunteers in it or that has other um, adults that are normally involved in participating and they haven't been able to take part in it, it's a, a really nice way to help motivate them and keep them connected um, because a lot of people involved in uh, different clubs are also friends. So it's nice to, uh, nice to encourage those opportunities when you can. Thank you. Sonia, some just a quick uh, advice or encouragement and then I will do the menti with them. I, I didn't forget. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think the important thing is to remember that there is no right or wrong. There, there is just being creative for yourself. And um, to me, what I find the most important aspect is to stay in touch with others and to chat and to talk about it 
say, oh, I'm dealing with this, I'm dealing with that. Or also, I found this works really well and to share that excitement and knowledge. Um, just keep the conversation going, uh, find a buddy. I mean, reach out to us, reach out to your communities, reach out to parents, um, just keep people involved and in the know, keep talking about it. And um, it's bound to be a great event. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we are planning to use uh, in, an online tool. We also recommend a Mentimeter. So Sonia, could you stop your sh uh, share of screen? And for those participants who are uh, still joining us, still looking at us, I will invite you, wait a second, to go to menti.com. You can use a browser from your uh, telephone or another browser uh, in on your laptop or PC and just uh, type in the code you see on the screen. So menti.com, type the code and let us know one thing you took away from this webinar. It can be a feeling, a tool like Scratch, Kahoot or anything you will take away from this webinar type your answer and then just, just um, push submit. Maybe Gabriela or Jacek, the meet and code team can also help me put uh, putting in the chat section the instructions. Thank you. Scratch already participants have um, figured it out. Color Dojo exactly. Finding the bug format. Hmm, interesting. We will leave this some more minutes you can see on the right uh, side of the screen below so three participants have already joined it and i'm encouraging you all to join maybe you need a, a little bit more time but as i can see the cloud keeps get getting better that's a great thing offline coding yes we can do coding also offline as sonia and nula also mentioned and we well they talked a lot about a lot of challenges but we have to keep in mind that with challenges are always at a step um, near the solutions coder dojo yes thank you coder dojo for this awesome webinar and we will we of course encourage you to do your own coder dojo club club i can proudly say that i know that in romania we have a lot of coder dojo clubs Keep connected, exactly. As Sonia and Nula also mentioned, it's very important just to, to keep connected to the community, to your, to your students, to all your beneficiaries. Open and safe session. Yes, Sonia, see, they want safe sessions. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Coder Dojo resources. For those, uh, I think we had a question. So if you would like to revisit this uh, this presentation, you can check out the Meet and Code Facebook page, the official Facebook page, and you can find this recording. It will stay forever on our Meet and Code Facebook page and also on Associatia TechSoup. Engage children, yes. So I think we'll, we will stop now thank you all for participating again and we encourage you to keep coding keep connected and just be part of this um, this this, uh, this meet and code community and whenever you have a question for our guests or of uh, for us meet and code please feel free to contact us so thank you all and see you another time Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.